Very warm welcome um, once again to our talk, and a particularly warm welcome to those of you who are friends. Um, thank you for continuing to support us. Um, anybody who wants to become a friend, by the way, um, it's all on the website, and you get fantastic discounts to talk like this. <laughs> Quite good anyway. <laughs> um, I was um, always a rifleman and uh, spent most of my time trying to stay as well away from tanks as I possibly could. Um, but they have, in the example, made a massive contribution um, to warfare, a lot more so than the First World War. And we're very, very lucky indeed to have Geoffrey Messi Holt with us tonight to tell us all about that. Geoffrey. Thank you. Now, you may well wonder why I've just put up a slide of Horsey Cain's Church. Apart from the fact that Pedestown says it's a very nice and interesting Norman church. Well, if you go approximately where I where that is there, there's a small park to Kathleen, she was named as Kay, and Eric McCready. And if you went 50 yards further on, you'd find Harold Macmillan. And of course, Harold Macmillan was wounded for the third time at the Battle of Fleurs Courselette which is on the 15th of September 1916, is, of course, the first time tanks went into action. And if you read his memoirs, there are actually two lines on tanks where he says they were vaguely interesting, but nothing much more. <laughs> <laughs> now, you may ask, why on earth are we talking about Eric McCready? He was a local personality. They set up the uh, Horsey Cane's Cahan Twinning. Uh, they ran a small hotel Bishu Hotel, as we now call it, just down the road from Horsted Canes. He did local films, and there are people within my village who still remember Eric McCready. And the reason is because I was phoned up about, must be three years ago now, by Jill McCready, who's a local historian, and this is about proof of value of local historians, who said, I gather you know something about tanks. Well, I spent 37 years in the Royal Tank Bench, but and before somebody asked me the question, I did that because I like tanks. <laughs> <laughs> on there. And therefore, it was fair. I said to her, yes, I do know something about tanks. And she said, do you know anything about something called McCready? And I, I, I dread that kind of question, to be quite honest with you, because I'm not a genealogical historian, and it's a specialist subject, and it's quite hard work. And often, even with the tank call records, quite honestly, you're lucky to get one or two references, even if he's an officer. But she then said, he has a military cross. I'll come back to what the military cross is, just to remind you later. And immediately I thought, well, oh, thank God for that, because that means two things. One, he's an officer, so the records will probably be slightly better. And two, and most importantly, there will be a citation to his military cross. And the citations were surprisingly well written, as we're about to discover on this presentation. And this was fantastic, because I had buried in the cemetery of my local church a tank corps. He ends up a major in the Second World War, but he's a captain in the First World War, who is an almost perfect illustration of the struggle that the British Army and the tank corps went through between late 1916, which is the dreadful slaughter of the Somme, to what is, I would argue, victory in what's called the Hundred Days, which lasts from the 8th of August to the 11th of November. And I would argue that by the 5th of November, the German army is a defeated army, which is the only logical explanation to the signature of the armistice. And therefore, I'm going to use Eric McCready. I'll call him McCready. His uh, his fellow officers called him Mac, as we'll discover, but I'm sure he would have called me Paul McCready in the normal way of that age. I'm going to follow Eric McCready because he's a really good example of the difficulty and the way in which the British Army adapted between 1916 and 1918 in what academics now reject as a learning curve, but I would argue is a learning curve. So we're going to look at Eric McCready. Uh, let me introduce you to him. Uh, we'll follow where he starts his military career. On there, he was uh, 5 foot 11. He had a 41 inch chest. He weighed about 11 stone. And he had to wear glasses. And we know that from his medical records. Uh, he was an Irishman. His father ha had been 
uh, the, the journalists and publish one of the leading journals on cycling and then motorsports uh, in Ireland. Uh, on there, he'd been to the same public school as Oscar Wilde and Beckett, interestingly enough, uh, in what's now Northern Ireland. So he came from a, I would say, a classic middle class officer's background, volunteer officer's background, I would hasten to add on that. He had gone to Bristol University in 1913 <coughs> to do a motor. Uh, sports and engineering degree, one of the first ever, but just before um, uh, just before the war broke out, his father asked for him to come back to give him a hand running the firm. He came back, but the important thing about that is it meant he could drive a motor vehicle. Again, quite rare. Remember, the first motor vehicle on British roads was only 19 years before the outbreak of the First World War, and the last horse-drawn uh, bus to serve London literally stopped working the day that war broke out in 1914 and horses dominate completely transport in the First World War. Uh, to give you an example, 4th Army had 55,000 horses, 30,000 mules and donkeys and about 2,000 trucks. Right. So this is a horse-born <laughs> world where, where a tank is a sophisticated item. Uh, McCready um, <coughs> volunteers for service uh, in a improvised ambulance uh, unit, which, uh, in a classic story again, the beginning of the First World War, two sons of a well-off gentleman who owned a very large taxi firm, and the road taxi firms were posh at that time, on their uh, volunteer uh, to convert 15 or 16 uh, taxis into ambulances and then managed to get <coughs> volunteers who can drive and amusingly McCready's co-driver was Arthur C. Rank and yes that's the Arthur C. Rank <coughs> who becomes the famous uh, film man on there so he was in good company if nothing else on there they're very quickly put into the army in the way that happens in, uh, in 1914 mm. There's not too much checking the paperwork, although all the paperwork, I have to say, is correct, which is why I know what height and that he wore glasses he is on there. And by early 1915, he's deployed to um, France. He describes this as a nice cushy number. Right, he does it from early 1915 until mid-1916. It's not a nice cushy number at all, because these ambulances were used to take casualties from near the front line usually by night to avoid German aircraft on there. And if you if you were travelling by night, of course, you had to have muffled lighting, which meant that driving must have been pretty difficult, as it was, and you were undoubtedly going to be shelled for the first bit as you were coming out. They would then take casualties back to the large hospitals in places like Boulogne, for example. So it was no cushy number. Sometime in the middle of 1916, McCready somehow f discovered that these newfangled things called tanks, and the interesting thing is, he must have found this out before the first tank went into action. I still haven't worked out how he managed that. Anyway, he, he <coughs> uses a bit of um, leverage. His brother was a senior medical officer in a uh, division that was forming in Norfolk, and he is commissioned into the Hertfordshire Regiment you couldn't be commissioned direct into the tank corps in 1916. That doesn't happen until 1918. And as a side, aside, in 1918, more officers were being trained to join the tank corps than Sanders now puts through in its total on that, which gives you an idea of how small the British Army is and how large an officer terms the tank corps was. He joins the Hartford Regiment. Luckily for, for him, he doesn't go to the Hertfordshire Regiment because I think it's, there were five or six other officers commissioned at that date, and within three months, two were dead, two had been wounded, <coughs> and one actually survived intact on the McCready is sent straight to Bollington. Nothing's changed. Bollington and Lulworth. Lulworth was for the firing ranges, just like now. Bollington. Bollington's taken over because it's a large piece of fairly useless ground in agricultural terms, which had been used as a trading area before. On there. And he joins I, 
which is going to become 9th Battalion of the Tank Corps. The battalion forms, it takes from uh, late 1916, it's in the first wave of expansion of a tank corps, it expands to nine battalions, and those nine battalions are the battalions that are going to action the Battle of Cambrai. You've heard me talk about Cambrai. I battalion has a very successful action. Um, it takes a tiny little um, uh, hamlet called La Vecchidi uh, as a loss, total loss, to the infantry and tanks of about 100 men. Just to give you an idea, six months before, the British Army had tried to take Bullecourt, well, I'm including the Australians of this, which was a place only just bigger than the Beckening, and it had cost 20,000 casualties <coughs> to do that. So this is a significant change in the nature of warfare, Conrad. Unfortunately for McCready, his tank ditches uh, because the Hindenburg Line was wider than they predicted, and when they came up to try and get across the Hindenburg Line, they got stuck in it. He wasn't the only person. He has two further actions at Cambrai on there. He's commanding a tank at this stage. And the battalion is then withdrawn, and they should have expected that they would get a nice, quiet winter to get the tanks back into Nick, to train on the new tanks they were getting, which were the Mark V and the medium A Whippet, which I call Whippet from now on. On there, I'll talk about those in a minute. Unfortunately for him and for the British Army, the German Army thought otherwise of that. And as the battalion history says, quite correctly, it says no one had the slightest idea that we were about to be swept into the whirlpool of conflict. We had implicit confidence in the defences of the British Army, fostered by the tales of wonderful trenches, masses of barbed wire, artillery and thousands of infantry waiting eagerly for the first sight of a Bosch head above the parapet. For us, it was almost another case of Nero fiddling while Rome burned. On the 21st of March 1918, the first day <laughs> of the... Uh, second Battle of the Somme, to be precise, and if you remember Howard's End, Howard's End is the infantry in an outpost waiting for the 21st of March, and not many of them would have survived on that, which is precisely why Howard's End is interesting. <coughs> the British Army suffered one of its worst defeats. We lose approximately 20, just over 21,000 prisoners to a German army that outnumbers about two to one after a five-hour artillery barrage, which was the most powerful artillery barrage, certainly certainly for the First World War, probably in history. The Russians might have managed larger on the Eastern Front in 44-45, but we are talking about vast scales on that. And there is total pandemonium, it is fair to say, at the beginning of what's called the March Retreat, when the British Army retreats, and it's almost a right at some stages, but not quite. And you can tell how desperate the situation is, because the JHQ is reduced to making the tank corps produce dismounted teams. Now, the one thing you really don't want is for tankies to be put on foot with machine guns. It's extremely dangerous for all parties. In my <laughs> <laughs> but 9th Battalion was in the process of trying to convert to the medium A, and the whole thing happens at such pace that the only thing they can do with 9th Battalion is to issue them with Lewis guns and send them out to try and assist in plugging the gaps. You might say, would it make much difference? Well, the answer is a, a tank corps battalion can produce about 84 Lewis guns as dismounted teams. Since an infantry battalion at this time only had 16, that's actually quite a lot of extra firepower, and particularly it, it would have a high officer ratio. One of the officers who's sent to do that is McCready. And McCready and one of his uh, subaltern, uh, one of his soldiers, leaves a really interesting description. They're rushed by truck. They were in a place called Bray. Oh, sorry, I'm, I'm being First World War centric here. There's Emya on there. There's Cambrai. And Arras is just at the top of the map there. So we're at right bang in actually what was the 1916 Somme battlefield. The tank corps was in process of refurbishing in Bray, 
Um, they are rushed by truck up to near Montauban, and McCready describes advancing through stragglers, through troops retreating, through a fair degree of chaos, to Montauban, which if you know 1916 is a place of dreadful slaughter, on there, uh, in order to try and plug a gap that had taken place between 5th Army, which was down here, and 3rd Army, which is down here. And of, uh, as we all know, the weakest point of any disposition is the interformation boundary. In this case, this is a very big interformation boundary. And the Germans went stupid. They'd spotted the, the gap. MacReady describes coming up to a place called Bernafle Wood, which is just up here. Uh, and interestingly, he describes arriving in the wood and seeing a, a multi mass of, uh, of degraveled cavalrymen. They were on foot. Never have cavalrymen on foot either, please on there, and any other person that they can manage to, to get together, who cheered them as they appeared, because it involved extra firepower, basically. And interestingly, if you go to the fact museum, there's a letter which McCready probably never saw, which is written by one of his soldiers to the relatives of another soldier called Dowding, who was killed in this action. And he describes McCready as a true officer and gentleman, I think. It's a good compliment from a soldier who doesn't know that the officer is going to read it and gives you an idea of what MacReady was like on there. And he says that MacReady saw that Dowding had been shot, rushed under fire to try and recover him, brought the body, body back, but that's all he could do. They then retreat under fire step by step. And this is one of those classic little actions which eventually result in the German attack being stormed. Lots of people resisting quite hard individual small-scale actions. There is also, and I can't resist in doing this, an action that's fought by the other battalion that's converting to Whippets, which is 3rd Tank Battalion. 3rd Tank Battalion had just completed its conversion to the medium A, and it was so rushed that on the 23rd of March, remember we're two days after the major offensive, they're told, stop converting to medium A's, go and fire your tanks, it would be a good idea to fire your tanks before you actually go into action, and get yourself ready, which takes them about a day, and then one company is rushed from down here up to the area of Kulakon, because the Germans are about to break through in this area. There is a substantial gap between Himitel here and that is the result of the failure to withdraw fast enough five corps from the Fletcher salient, which is back in this area <coughs> on there. <coughs> 14 Whippet medium A tanks are rushed. A Whippet can do eight miles an hour. Right, that's as fast as cavalry of the trot, which is, I'm pretty certain, why eight miles an hour was specified. And as you'll see in a minute, that is significantly faster than a First World War heavy tank. A Mark IV could do about three miles an hour at a push with the wind blowing in the right direction. <laughs> and a Mark V could do a magnificent four and a half miles an hour because it had a larger engine. I'll talk about that in a minute. On that. Uh, uh, the, the 14 whippets are rushed north and as they are being rushed north, Le Q, Major Le Q Martel, for obvious reasons I will call Martel, uh, I think he's only MC at this stage, but he will be DSO and MC and a bar to his MC on there, it, who is a staff officer in the tank corps, is arriving in Zuast, and yep, he's not your classic so-called cliché of a British staff officer in the First World War, he's right sharp, and he is going forward to try and find out what's going on. The tank corps sent up, headquarters sent out, um, officers to try and ascertain in detail what was going on, because it was one of the major problems. Remember, we're not talking about sophisticated communications here, so effectively when you start retreating, your communications collapse because you're largely dependent on telephones and the telephone system, the Germans took it out, basically, on that. He arrives up here in the morning of the 26th of March, and he the situation is so chaotic that he leaves his car he can't go any further by motor transport, and he moves towards Hemitown on foot, 
Um, he's quite a character, is Martel. He's a general in the Second World War. He commands 50 Div in France in 1940. He's Royal Engineers, and he was known as the Slosher because he was a prize fighter before the First World War. As we'll see, that's quite important to my story. He comes from Zuras, goes through 50, the remnants of 51st Highland Division, where he meets officers of 51st Highland Division who say that their soldiers have had nothing to eat for three days because the logistics collapsed on there, but were still prepared to fight, but they had no idea what was going on. He then gets through, and, oh, and they say that heavy term has fallen to the Germans, which would have been extremely serious because that would have marked the breach of the last significant defensive line that the British Army had prepared, the so-called Purple Line. Of it. <clears throat> in fact, when he arrives at Heavy Town, he discovers the remnants, and it is remnants, of 19th Infantry Division are still holding fairly firmly the village. But the situation is critical because the Germans are advancing towards the village of Kalankong, which is on a piece of dominant high ground. The ground hasn't changed at all, interestingly enough. Huh? The dominant high ground, and if that fell, that gave the potential to the Germans to be able to outflank all our positions in either directions. He meets the Brigadier Commanding 56th Brigade, which is one of the mighty infantry brigades, and as they're looking south, they see some tanks come towards them. These are whippets, they're actually whippets from uh, 10 section of 3rd Battalion. And the British, some of the British infantry panic because they've never seen a whippet before. And tank panic, as it's known, took place. And Martel rushes after the soldiers running into the distance. I'm sure he used highly intellectual arguments to convince them <laughs> to withdraw. <laughs> the fact that it's called a slosher had nothing to do with it, did it? On that. Having recovered from that one, he stops the whippets and says to them, you need to patrol in this direction. And he puts them under command of 56th Brigade. He then walks across the battlefield to Colancourt and finds that Colancourt is firmly now held by a combination of whippets and a dismounted company of 8th Tank Battalion on there. He then walks back. Right. So he has just walked, I reckon, as a crow flies, something like 13 miles across the battlefield, backwards and forwards on that. Quite an impressive performance. And the reason why I know about all this is because there's a one-page report in the Tank Museum, written by Martel, describing what he did. And Fuller says that Martel was almost lunatic in his bravery on that. On that. What had happened? What had happened was that the 14 whippets arrived down here <coughs> and refueled. They'd moved through the night. I think that's the first example, for those of you into these things, of a roaming replay, as it's technically called. On there, the commanding officer of 3rd Tank Battalion, who is a cameraman called Charrington, I think he was a 15th, if I'm correct, he certainly played polo with courage, which is probably the same courage, by the way, on there. Courage was on the brigade commanders. Goes forward with the company commander, is a man called Price. Uh, Price is very important because he takes part in the first tank to tank action on the 24th of April, but that's another presentation. On them. They go forward by car and they enter Kulakon. They do a very quick appreciation of what's going on and what they can see is that there is British outposts along here which are now straggling back the remnants of the British infantry division and there is a major gap in the British line. There are New Zealanders who've marched literally through the night in order to get, in, get there in time who are coming up but they won't be in position for at least an hour or two. Uh, for that. They come back and they say to the 14 whippets, go straight down this road, turn right, and you can, you can do this now, it's quite amusing, turn right through the village, and then as you're coming out the village, turn left. The first two sections, which are 9 and 12 sections, are ordered to turn right in that direction, and the second two are to, ordered to turn north. The second two include 10th section, which is the section that um, Martel met somewhat early on there. They do their eight miles an hour, straight through the village, come out the other end, and as they're coming out the other end, they see the British infantry retreating through Colancourt. There were probably Lewis gun teams and 8th tank battalions setting up by this time. 
because they've appeared in truck, in a truck, some transport in order to do that. So the timing is absolutely opportune. As the first section comes around the corner, on there they meet 400 Germans going in that direction, trying to get into Kolaka. They rush the Germans, 12th Battalion chases the poor people for 2,600 yards to a village called Uschomili, and the second section, 9th section, herds the remainder back to be captured by 8th Tank Battalion dismounted loose gun teams as they're coming in. The two sections of the north there go through on that. And it's a really nice example of a, um, of a uh, rapid action done. And I'll quote from what Ch the war diary says, probably written by the CO. He says, the action was an admirable mechanical test of the medium A machine, which did itself very well. All the machines were on the move practically continuously for 16 hours and went into action without any halt. The fact that there was not a single mechanical breakdown done on any tank during the whole of this hour reflects great credit on the tank commanders, the leading drivers and the tank engineers. It particularly reflects credit when you think that if you were a driver, you had two gearboxes, so you had to double D clutch twice, <coughs> rather than the knee. And the other way of steering it was to steer it on a... You had to adjust effectively the two engines, and if you stalled it, the whole vehicle collapsed on there. And just to make their life even easier, it got so hot in the crew compartment or whip it that it became impossible to load ammunition because the brass cases had expanded differentially to the steel, right? And you've got to be very hot inside the crew compartment for it to be that bad on there. So all the more credit on, on there the whippets, the whippets were there. And the last action fought by British tanks in the First World War, which is on the 6th of November 1918, is interestingly whippets on there. On there. After the march retreat ended, it actually ends at the beginning of April, uh, the tank battalions were given some time to uh, regenerate themselves, and they were given new equipment. And you can tell the degree of difficulty that was going on about tank production, because you'll probably recall I said 9th Battalion was supposed to become a Whippet Battalion. It's supposed to become the 3rd Whippet Battalion. It never does, because we've run out of Whippets, basically. Uh, I won't go into the reasons, but they are uh, an uh, almost textbook example of how to not do large armoured vehicle procurement, and I did that for a rather long time, I care to admit, at the end of my military career on that. As a result, they're told, no, 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 you won't finish your conversion to Whippets, then you'll be converted to Mark Fives on there. And they receive the Mark V, this is a Mark V. Uh, if you know the Mark I to four, you will say, well, it looks virtually identical on there, and it retains this rhomboid shape, which I remind you, the rhomboid shape is a really good shape if you want a platform that's absolutely stable cross-country. And this long step at the front means that you climb steps that no modern tank could do. Modern tanks would require specialist armour to get through some of the grounds of this tank. The ground pressure of a uh, Mark series tank is about half that of a current main battle tank uh, per square inch. Uh, which is, you know, we're almost in CBRT levels, for those of you who are familiar on that. So it has a very, very good tactical mobility cross-country on there. The significant differences to the Mark IV are that it has a gearbox that allows the driver to drive the vehicle without any assistance from anybody else. On the Mark IV, you required three men to steer the vehicle because you had three gearboxes on it. On this, you've got one gearbox, it's an epicyclic gearbox, and now I will not attempt to explain the functions of an electrocyclic box that requires a PhD or even think about it, in my view. On there, the important thing is, it meant on the Mark V, <coughs> unlike on the previous series of tanks, the Mark I to Mark IV, a driver could literally turn by doing like that, which was useful for two things and others. One is it meant you could zigzag, which made it a bit more difficult for artillery to hit you, and the second one was that you could run over determined, and they were lots of determined German machine gunners. And the Mark V must have come as a very nasty surprise to the German machine gunners, because until then, basically, Mark IVs went straight, because it's so difficult to steer on there. The other significant change 
is that you have 150 brake horsepower engine, a Ricardo engine, and yes, that's the same firm as Ricardo now. He was a brilliant young engineer, and he designed an engine that produced about 50% more power in the same, basically, space volume on there. And that's significant because it means it can go slightly faster, but more importantly, it makes it more reliable on there. And the other changes were this cab, which is important to my story in a minute, which was supposed to enable the commander to not have to sit in the front of the vehicle, there, to be precise, next to the driver, and give him a bit more of an ability to see. As we'll see, it didn't really work. And before somebody asked me the question, what's this? It's called an unditching beam, and it's used so that you've got, on a Mark V, you can attach it from inside the vehicle. On a Mark IV, you have to get out of the vehicle to do that. You attach it to the tracks, and it rolls underneath the tracks, and if you're bellied on mud, it will pull you out quite effectively on that. Used extensively at the Third Battle of Ypres for surprise surprise on that. Uh, so this represents a significant improvement in capability as far as the tank corps is concerned, particularly when you add whippets onto that. Now, the um, tank corps had been told by Fuller, their chief of staff, that they were to be ready in all capabilities by the 1st of August 1918. That was a brilliant guess because, of course, the Battle of Amiens actually takes place on the 8th of August 1918. But slightly, in fact, I should think considerably to the surprise of a 9th Tank Battalion, at about 10 o'clock on the uh, 20, uh, sorry, on the 18th of July, uh, General Brigadier General Courage, who's commanding 5th Tank Brigade, is told that he must produce a battalion to support the French 9th Corps in attack in this area in order to take out a um, bridgehead that the Germans held in preparation for the Battle of Amiens. Of course, they didn't know that that was why they were doing it. You might say, well, why did the French need to have British tanks? The answer is the French had run out of heavy tanks. Their heavy tanks were, were taking part in a really significant counter-attack that day, interestingly, which nobody's ever heard about on that second Battle of the Marne. And the French had used the template of Cambrai, and so actually you're looking at a battle, it's a rare moment, I did the French staff college, my mother's French, a rare moment where actually the French paid privilege to the Brits, because they copied basically what we did at Cambrai, with some slight adjustments. And in order to, to launch this attack, all their heavy tanks were being used on these major <coughs> attacks. They asked for the loan of a battalion to assist the call its attack. And this is a very good example of, in first world war times, rapid action. The first thing that happens is, of course, the tanks have physically got to move from there to there. They can't move by rail because the main railway line which runs along here was under German shelling, which is why it was important to take out the Germans in this area. So they had to track it, which for first world war is quite a long way. And that involves basically a five-day move entirely by night because, of course, the Germans have got aerial reconnaissance and so you can't do it by day. On there, and remember, <laughs> the tank can't do more than about probably three miles an hour max on there, so that's actually a long way on there. Uh, on there. And as this is happening, McCready, who by now is a section commander, a section confusingly enough in the tank world, is three tanks. Yeah, I don't know why it wasn't called a platoon, but it's called a section. On there. He's commanding three tanks. On there, the section commanders go forward, they meet with their French counterparts, they do a ground reconnaissance, all the battle procedures correct, if you think about it, on top of that. And then the tank commanders and the first drivers, this is, the Mark V's had two drivers on there, and the first drivers go forward to have a look at the ground. Soldiers are briefed on the day before the action on there, and McCready and all the section commanders are got together by his commanding officer, Woods, for a briefing. And Woods briefs them on what the plan is. The plan's fairly simple. The piece of ground that they're going to advance across, this is the, the French front line was about here. The village of Tilly was held by the French. On there, the objective was to seize this plateau. And the ground, again, the ground <coughs> has barely changed here. It's a really interesting little battlefield tour, and that gives you an idea, by the way, at the bottom 
of what the ground looks like. It's quite open ground with very few hedges on it, but some significant woods. And you've got a plateau that runs along here through Sauvigny up to three woods, which are the Bois de Sauvigny, the Bois du Harpon, and uh, the Bois de Saint-Hibert, the River Avre is here, and the Battle of Amiens is over that way, but that's not for a few days on there. So the aim is to capture that piece of ground. It steeply falls off in that direction, and it steeply falls off in that direction. The plan was a sim very simple one, typical First World War simple plan, because the artillery dominated the plan. And remember, there are no radios, so you have to have a time barrage on there. The first phase was that one of the companies of 9th Battalion would lead four French battalions to the red line on there. And then, and the critical phase is the next one, but the next phase, one of the companies of, uh, uh, of uh, C Battalion, uh, C Company, for precise, of 9th Tank Battalion, would seize the Bois de Sauvigny with the French. And to the left of that, most of MacReady's B Company would seize the ground up to the Green Line. One section of C Company was told to cover the flank on here. And Woods turns to MacReady and says, Mac, I've selected you to do this. And MacReady says, because MacReady was interviewed by Bob Sellens, who was the local headmaster, probably in the early 80s, a few years before he died, and we have an interview with a transfer, <coughs> thankfully, where MacReady describes what he did in the tank corps, and of course, not surprisingly, although he doesn't say it is where he wins a decoration, he talks in some detail about this battle. And so he says that what happens is, Wood says to him, right, you know, you've got this job, and there are his fellow lieutenants sniggering in the corner, because they say to him, as they're walking out, he said, MacReady, right, uh, I, you should win a cross for this one. And MacReady says, I want to win a cross, but I'd like the cross to be a metal one, please, and not a wooden one. <laughs> right. Just to explain the significance of that remark, um, the ten, uh, in the First World War, uh, the first thing they do is they put up a temporary cross, and those temporary crosses vary in design quite a lot. On there. And if you go to some English churches, Burwash, for example, as you walk into Burwash Church, you can actually see uh, six of the crosses because they were sent back to UK. They were then replaced by the headstones that we're familiar with, the ones of the Commonwealth War Graves organisation, which, by the way, as a side, I can't praise enough as an organisation on that. Uh, and the metal thing was a, uh, a cross. I'll explain the military cross. This is a military cross. It's actually a Second World War one, but it's, a, it's the same design and layout on that. On there. Uh, so clearly MacReady knew that he'd been given a bit of a poison chalice on this. And at 7.30 on the 23rd of July, his three tanks moved forwards to the second phase of the battle. Now his tanks, it was raining, and he's got behind him 600 French infantrymen and a what's called a rolling barrage in the front. He is to take these two woods here, and of course his problem is he's exposed to fire from this high ground in this area. And MacReady describes his three tanks moving forwards with the French infantry, and they reach the second wood, this fairly heavy German resistance, and as they come up the second wood, MacReady <coughs> is in, I'll just go back um, one slide, oh sorry, my fault, wrong way, let's get the right way. back a couple. MacReady is actually in this cab here. The commander, who's a sergeant, is in the front here and the driver's there. And that's relevant to my story. Um, as they're getting towards... <coughs> oops, sorry. Wrong, way. Wrong way. You can't get the staff these days, that's the problem. <laughs> right. As they're getting towards this wood, MacReady describes in the, uh, in the interview that there's a big bang uh, and he says, he says, what's going on? The tank stops moving. What's going on? What's going on? And the uh, two crewmen next to him say, uh, I think you should look above your head. And there's a great big hole where his tank has been hit on there. 
and he realises that he's going to have to give the order to evacuate the tank <coughs> of that. So they evacuate the tank and they go to, back to this wood and then they realise that one of the crewmen had opened the wrong door. He'd opened the door facing the Germans and he's been shot in the legs. So McCready and the sergeant go back, they recover the uh, wounded crewman, and then they realise that the tank hasn't been fully knocked out. Now remember, the Germans had not captured so far any Mark Vs. So they go back to the tank, they leave the wounded man to the remaining crewman, and they go back to the tank again. Remember, this is all under fire, and they're going to blow their tank up, uh, you can tell how strong health and safety was in the First World War because in order to blow the tank up there was an explosive charge inside the vehicle. <laughs> right. And that was a lesson learnt from the Battle of Cambrai where the Germans had recovered quite a few damaged British tanks on there. McCready says that he lit the blue touch paper but it didn't go off. They retreat back to the wood where they find the remainder of the crewmen <coughs> arguing about what they're going to do with the wounded man. And the reason why they're arguing is because the Germans have come up to them. There's a German, most of a German battalion sitting against wood and said, uh, can we have your wounded, please? And McCready says that the reason why the Germans were coming up to ask for the wounded was that the French didn't have any means of processing the casualties and the Germans knew that the French would not be too tender with them if they captured them. So it was their insurance policy. So McCready says, yep, it'll patch him up. East, and they start withdrawing back. And McCready says, I was by this stage suffering from shell shock. He probably wasn't suffering from shell shock. He was probably actually suffering from carbon monoxide poisoning. Mm -hmm. And the reason why he was suffering from carbon monoxide poisoning was because a Mark V, which was a very good tank uh, in many ways, they hadn't done any testing. They were in such a rush. And they failed to notice that they'd done something to the exhaust system which meant that if you ran a Mark V for a few miles, eventually it would start venting the exhaust fumes inside the crew compartment. This doesn't tend to be too good for your health <laughs> because you get carbon monoxide poisoning. And we know the detail of this because there was proper medical testing done. Uh, for those of you from Medi this thing's called wet bulb globe. And they tested the level of carbon monoxide. Put it this way, you wouldn't want to be there in too much rush on that. And I've actually met somebody quite recently who did a trial with Mark Fives uh, in the system, so attack tank used them, he said they all got carbon monoxide poisoning on there. I was slightly amused because you thought something in the tank used might have remembered that one uh, on there. So he's probably was suffering from carbon monoxide poisoning. They get back. Now, to be fair to McCready, he's done what he was supposed to do. They've taken the two woods on there. Two tanks get knocked out. And as we'll see in a minute, McCready did his best to make sure that they weren't going to suffer. The last tank actually recovers. The French take the full objective, but the uh, uh, Knights Tank Battalion lose, I think it's 14 tanks, which is about 40% casualties. And the reason is because at the last phase, they're exposed to German fire because the French hadn't put a smoke screen down right in front of the exercise on there. So it's an interesting action but there is an interesting sideline to this action, which is that some days after that, the French corps commander, a man called Duplessis, appeared, and he gave a series of awards. To He, he praised the battalion, as he should have done, uh, on that, and he gave a set of awards. And he gave a set of croix de guerre, that's the croix de guerre, and there were also military crosses and military medals awarded afterwards. A Crete is one of the places that get the Croix de Guerre. What's the Croix de Guerre? The Croix de Guerre was a medal that the French had uh, invented, created at the beginning of the Second, First World War. Uh, we have a, a slightly curious award, which is called Mentions and Dispatches. The French decided quite intelligently that if you had a mention in dispatches, you would get a medal from there. As you know, the British thing is to have the oak leaf, which nobody, even people in the army, in my experience, actually understand the significance of on that. The French solution was to issue quite guerre. And the other thing the French could do, which they did here, was they could actually issue a decoration to a unit. So 9th Tank Battalion uh, 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 acquire a quite guerre, very rare, I have to say, 
Um, the Devon <coughs> Dorset of Willie Boot is one of the other examples. There are only about 16 British units that get this on there. And they actually wore a little strip. And I did once try and convince the Army's committee that it would be a good idea to recreate it. I have to say I got short shrift on that one. <laughs> uh, on there. And some days later, they award a series of military crosses on there. And I'm going to read you the citation for MacReady's military cross because it has an interesting contrast to what he said he did. During the operation south of Murray on July the 23rd, 1918, Second Lieutenant MacReady commands a section of tanks with great uh, coolness, the greatest coolness and ability, in an exposed flank. When his own tank was put out of action by a direct hit, he at once went with smoke bombs to cover the other tanks from the same danger an action which was successful and allowed time for the tanks to change their direction. After this, he went back to the tank under heavy fire, shelling and machine gunning to blow up the tank which had been hit so as to prevent it falling into the enemy hands. This was successfully accomplished. He discovered that one of his crew was lying in a very exposed place, wounded in the leg, so went out under heavy machine gun fire and carried him to safety. During the action, he carried out a very valuable reconnaissance and went and gave a clear report. Second Lieutenant MacReady showed an utter disregard for his personal safety and a devotion to duty under very trying <coughs> circumstances. That report was almost certainly written by his commanding officer, Woods. But what's interesting is, as ever in the First World War, people describing what they did were infinitely modest. Note, MacReady did blow the tank up, because I'm sure Woods wouldn't have got that wrong. Note, MacReady actually goes back <laughs> under fire to carry back the wounded man. He didn't say that. On there, on there, on there. And the smoke bit, MacReady doesn't even mention it. Right. Treat with some caution, therefore, what First World War officers say about what they do, because they are, in my experience, incredibly modest. Oh, and by the way, they had to write, every tank had to write a report, I think, on a battle history sheet, after every action, and yes, before somebody asked me the question, I did manage to find a second lieutenant who had copied another second lieutenant's battle history sheet, verbatim, <laughs> on there. And the reason why I know he was a lying but very brave bloke is because I know he was lying because he got a military cross for the action and it doesn't match in any way what he said he did. <laughs> on that. Quite rare, I have to say, on that. Uh, so from a great view, this was a thoroughly satisfactory action. He got a military cross. There are only about, uh, I think it's 30,000 or so military crosses awarded uh, to the British Army. I remind you that at that time, the British Army had two awards, one for soldiers, which was the military medal, and the other, which was the military cross. That distinction was abolished uh, by John Major, I seem to remember, on there. Uh, and there is no comparison, by the way, with an Iron Cross. There were millions of Iron Crosses awarded. So there is no equation between a military cross or an enemy <coughs> and an iron cross because there were literally millions of them. Quite, you'd be quite rare to have a military cross in the British Army. To have an iron cross was almost impossible not to get, I have a sort of feeling, in the German Army uh, by the time you finished the war if you survived on that. McCready's battalion is then given some time to recover, which is the reason why they don't take part in the Battle of Amiens. Amiens, and again, that's another presentation. Amiens is the most important battle that the tank corps ever fought uh, on there. Arguably <coughs> the most important battle of 1918 because it marks the turn of the tide. The Germans I, uh, suffer a very severe defeat indeed. They lose more prisoners than we suffer casualties. And you're not going to win a war if you're the defender and you're losing more prisoners than you're inflicting casualties on your opponent, particularly in the First World War on that. But uh, Marshal Foch insisted to Haig that we must continue attacking to keep the pressure on the Germans. He'd understood that the reason why the German offensives in 1918 had failed was because they did not maintain the pressure. Maintaining the pressure meant that since the British Army was the only army that was both experienced and had reasonable amounts of manpower, the French were literally down to the last man and the Americans were really not properly trained and even in even in September, you can see that they have great problems on training, and I'll give you an example of that in a minute. The burden fell largely on the British Army. 
It meant a major pressure on the tank core because the tank core was not designed or strong enough to do multiple actions and therefore this placed a considerable pressure. And as a result, uh, his battalion is back in action on the 23rd of August in a series of offensives that are to push the Germans back onto the Hindenburg line on there. Uh, and they go all over the place. And the, the major action they fight, and McCready, this is the 25th of August, he, they're, they're sent to do an operation, but the operation is cancelled. You can see a sort of chaos of planning going on. They come back to their Liga. They're then told literally three hours later, off you go. Oh, and by the way, we'd like you to launch an attack for the Canadians at three o'clock the next morning. And before anybody tells me, yes, it was complete pitch darkness on there, they have just enough time to meet up with the Canadians. The war, the war history actually says that they had very constructive discussion. Arguably, the Canadians were the best units in the British Army, and they considered themselves to be the British Army. I hasten to add on that, although I'm sure an Australian would contest that on there. And the Canadians launch a massive offensive here which lasts something like eight days, a really crueling struggle to take the British Army from Arras and through the first significant breaching of what is in effect the Hindenburg Line in 1918. On there, McCready's tanks go into action on the first day of the offensive, but it becomes clear that the casualties of the tanks are such that Curry, the Corps Commander, decides to keep them in reserve until they get to the Drocou Quayon line, which is effectively a miniature Hindenburg line. And for that action, 9th Tank Battalion leads the Canadians across the, uh, the uh, Drocou Quayon line. And if you take the road going from Arras to Cambrai, you pass a Canadian monument, and that is the centre of the advance of 9th Battalion, followed by 12th Canadian Infantry Brigade on there. Um, not surprisingly, by the end of August, early September of 1918, um, the tank corps, like the rest of the British Army, is exhausted and they're given some time to recover as the action takes place, pushing the Germans back on the Hindenburg line. This is the crucial, I would argue, the crucial battle of the Hundred Days is the breaching of the Hindenburg line on there. And this is an extraordinarily large action. There are two and a half British armies involved in this. There are over a million men involved in it on the British side alone on there. And the objective is to breach through the Hindenburg Line. There's a subsidiary attack to the north by Third Army, who ironically enough are recapturing the ground they captured at Cambrai the year before. 62nd Infantry Division actually capture the same village, Avrancourt, which is why their monument is theirs inside, on there. But the major attack is going to go in here. On there, um, the major bit of the attack is supposed to be the American 2nd Corps, followed by the Australians, capturing the Hindenburg Line. And there is a subsidiary attack by 9 Corps in this area, which is what we're interested in, because in a nice piece of numbering, 9 Corps get 9th Tank Battalion, and they actually have one X painted on the side of all their tanks to say quite clearly that they are 9 Corps tanks and explain to the Americans in particular why tanks are going to go into the area. area. The uh, 9 Corps offensive is most famous for the capture of the Rinkeval Bridge, <coughs> one of the really significant feats of arms of the British Army, probably in history, I would argue. A Staffordshire Division, and I have to say a fairly nondescript division up to that moment, would prove that any British division, properly trained and properly led, and they were led by a man called <coughs> Boyd, who was only 40, and the brigade that actually sees on the brick of our bridge is commanded by a man called Campbell, VC, a guardsman, always have a guardsman if you want to do heroic actions in my experience, <laughs> on there. And he won his VC at Fleur's Corselet, right, with a hunting horn. Yeah, okay. uh, on there, but he was very brave on there, and they, they are going to seize this bridge, this is an amazing feat of arms because the canal is a massive military obstacle and it's perfectly timed etc and the insurance policy this is 9 Corps' insurance policy is that 9th Battalion uh, obviously can't get across the canal but there's a land bridge about this area where the canal has to go underground because it's at the water table on there a 9th Battalion moves up to the uh, front for the attack. This is 
this is the area where I'm sorry, the area we're interested in is just here, to be precise, but there's this massive attack that takes place along the whole line, starting on the 27th of September, with Fourth Army on the 29th of September launching their assault. Uh, MacReady, who by now is the second in command as a captain of his company, B Company, and 9th Battalion tanks are in the second wave. What they are going to do is they're going to catch up with 46th Division and 32nd Division as their second echelon goes across the Canal de saint and advances to breach the last Hindenburg line. There's one left, to be precise, there. Right, and these are formidable defensive systems. Right? There's RL British defensive line, there's Hindenburg Line 1, and remember Hindenburg Line is two sets of trenches, each Hindenburg Line with 100 yards of wire in front of it. So much wire that if a Mark V tank drove onto the wire, it was physically lifted by the wire for a few, few seconds, given the mass of wire, and the wires were in coils about that high on that. And in theory, the trenches were too wide for tanks to get through. 9th Battalion advances through the mist at 6.30. By then, the bombardment has gone down. I think they fired, they fired over a million rounds uh, in between the 27th of September and the 29th of September on there, which even for the First World War is quite a lot on there. They go across the land bridge, but as they start reaching towards the Hindenburg line, mist comes down. Uh, for some reason, at that time of the year in France, there was heavy mist, and there was heavy mist throughout 1918 on there. And as they go through the Hindenburg Line, and they're so professional, they don't even mention crossing the Hindenburg Line. No tanks ditch. They have no bridges. They carry things called cribs on top of them, which are great big constructions which you throw into a trench and which you then cross into the distance on there. The tank drives across it. Easier said than done on there. And as they're coming up here, McCready's company commander finds a load of extremely confused Americans who've run out of officers. Right. And he grabs the Americans and he finds some Australians who also want to fight. My experience, Australians always want to fight. That's another <laughs> story. Herds them all together and leads them to finish off, because the Germans were still resisting, the Germans in Norwa and going south on that. And the reason why I know that is because he got an MC for it. It's quite a Quite a nice MC, not many people get it for herding Australians and Americans <laughs> south. I think they were looking for a fight on there. They reach Rickerval. The attack has been so successful that the second echelon is already across, going into the distance on there. They catch up with four and a half miles an hour, catch up with the infantry as they're advancing towards the Hindenburg support line. That's another hundred yards of wire another two trench systems, and they lead the infantry across the Hindenburg support line, as they were supposed to do, towards the last line. The last line's just over there. That's taken a few days later. It's a really neat example of a perfectly organised First World War action, and when you think that's a subsidiary action, the core action, not the main action, it's the usual moral, always have a subsidiary action, because it might just be the one that works. <laughs> Effectively, all the stuff that went on to the north was an enormous diversion to make this action successful on that. Um, that is the last significant action that Knight's Tank Battalion has, because we've run out of tanks. There's been a massive failure in production of particularly Mark Vs, but also of Ribbons. <coughs> and we literally, physically, run out of tanks. Uh, so you get much smaller tank actions taking place. After that, the last action of Knight's Tank Battalion is, uh, excuse me, is, uh, this is, uh, that, that's Mons, by the way, that's where we started the war, of course. Right. We start the war there. Uh, the last tank action is near a place called Laudressy, right near the Canal Cana de Sambre, on there. Uh, and the last man to be killed in the tank corps is Major Robinson, MC of Bar, who was <coughs> killed walking back after the last attack. It was actually in 10th Battalion and he was walking back from there, and there is a, a real irony in this, he had commanded the tank at the first tank battle in history. So the poor man had done the whole lot. And that is the last Mark V action in the First World War. It is not the last Mark V action in history, 
Uh, that is actually in Berlin in 1945, where for reasons that nobody can work out, the Germans had two Mark Fives, and nobody's clear where they got them from, probably from the Estonians, because we'd given them to them, and so there were actually two Mark Fives. Whether those Mark Fives ever finally arrived in England, we don't know, but there are pictures of the Mark Fives used in provided block in 1945. As for MacReady, he leaves the army after the war, rejoins, uh, he, uh, sorry, leaves the army after the war, goes back to his father's firm, his father's died by then, sells his father's firm to Sackville Press in the early 30s, his first wife dies in the mid 30s, he rejoins uh, the army, but by then he's 40, so he does administrative jobs, Royal Tank Regiment again, uh, on there, and that's how he becomes a major on there, and at the end of the war, he remarries in 1944 uh, to uh, K on there, and they eventually end up running a Bichot Hotel at the Horsey Canes Hotel, which is now an old people's home, posh old people's home, uh, on there. Uh, and he retires eventually and goes to live at Six Bricks and Close on there, does his films and all the other stuff. And if you wonder where I live, I live there, that's it precisely, on there. And I have no doubt he went to the two pubs, the Green Man and the Crown, and he dies in 1982, and she dies about 10 years later on that. And he, they are both a well-respected and remembered couple this day. So I think you can say that Eric McCready is a really fine example of uh, the First World War British Army at its very best. Thank you very much. Um, yes. Was there a rank structure in each tank? I mean, was the driver an NCO? Uh, yes. Um, we're, we're running out of officers by 1918, so you quite often... Tanks were supposed to all be commanded by officers. And the reason was you've got no radios, so the tank is an independent unit of fire. And remember, a First World War tank is about half a uh, heavy, British heavy tank. That's about twice as much firepower as a as a modern tank. And think about it, it's got two six pounders, it's got two machine guns, it's got, it's got three machine guns on top of that. On <coughs> on that. I'm nursing my con. So uh, to answer your question, yes, yeah. They weren't exactly fuel efficient. Um, what was the frequency of tanks having two to be abandoned two because miles. good question, good question. Uh, 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 it's two miles to the gallon. Oh, no, sorry, two gallons to the mile. Sorry, two gallons to the mile, and a, a Mark V could do 45 miles before refueling. I know of only one example of um, tanks being lost as a result of not being able to refuel, and that's during the March retreat. It's surprisingly rare during the March retreat uh, on there, where there are tanks that had to be abandoned because literally they'd run out of fuel because they couldn't get the fuel forward on there. Uh, and remember, refueling was a complete nightmare because you don't even have jerry cans, you have little containers about that size, like the second, early Second World War ones on there. So at surprisingly rare, they run out of fuel. They're extremely well organised about refueling. And when they went into action, they almost always refueled directly before going into the action. And that is why they had to rally almost immediately after the action, because they had to refuel. Uh, a Mark V is slightly better. A Whippet could do 80 miles, uh, which is sensible on there. On there. Uh, but fuel is always a problem with tank. Uh, refueling is always a problem. And the fuel was of low quality. They did eventually force the army to get high quality fuel because the tanks were breaking down and was up the very poor quality of the fuel, the low octane. Like, yeah. Wasn't it a McCready who, who wrote in Planters Fields the poppies grow? Uh, was that? Uh, yes, but I think. Was that a relation? Is the name spelled the same way? McCready, you're right. No, no, no. Yes. no. Sorry, sorry, because the problem about McCready is that there are Z numbers of interpretation in name, right? Uh, and you can spell, spell it in several different ways. Trying to track down relatives is quite entertaining. McCray, or McCray. Sorry, I'm, sorry, I'm not an expert. I'm very good on tanks, but not too good on poetry. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah. One of the tank talks we've had um, that mentioned about the number of tanks that sank in the mud. Did the Mark V overcome this problem? Um, the, the sinking in the mud stories are almost entirely from the third battle of the, the Battle of Fashion Hill. And that is because everybody sunk in the mud. The mud was so bad and men were drowning literally in the mud on and no armoured vehicle, not even CBRT, for those of you who are familiar with Scorpion and it could go practically anywhere in my experience, because <coughs> the ground pressure was so that even CBRT would have bombed under those conditions. After that, on the whole, they try and choose ground that's hard. So Carlborough, for example, has chalk underneath the top layer, so the drainage is good on there. And they become more experienced, and you've got an unditching beam. They had the unditching beam even, it worked quite well, actually. But no, I mean, some of it, the conditions were so bad that nothing would have got through. And it's largely the third battle of Ypres that's a problem. Cambrai and after that, you don't see it so much. Of course, by the end of the, at the latter part of 100 days, the fighting is in open country, which of course means the ground. Because the problem is the ground gets churned up, not just by things like tanks, it's artillery that does most of the churning. So it's big artillery barrages that present the problem. And at Ypres, that broke the drainage ditch system, and it also rained, I mean they were very, very unlucky, I mean, it rained massively. At the beginning of the Battle of the Eat, it was okay, it then rained massively, and of course it changed the whole run. Most of those stories are to do with Eat. Huh? Yep, bon général. Jeffrey, I wonder if you're being marginally unfair in your comparison of the Military Cross and the Iron Cross. The, the Military Cross was, of course, of one type. Okay. The Iron Cross had endless divisions right from uh, the one that was lobbed out. No, 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 I, no, no, I was being slightly facetious, but even if you look at second class Iron Crosses, they are issuing the vast yeah, ones. Yeah. And and even the first class Iron Cross, I can't remember the exact figures, it's much, much bigger than that. I agree with you, but to be honest, those tend to be not soldier decorations, they tend to be officer decorations. Uh, because one of the nice things about our system is on the whole, the, I mean the French in the theory they had the Légion d'honneur, but in practice it was very rare for a soldier to get the Légion d'honneur. So if you ever get the French being snitty about us being a class of in society, point out to them the Légion d'honneur was very rarely awarded to soldiers in my experience. It wasn't largely an officer one. I take the point because you've got all the, the complicated stuff above yes. about with things, and you can see lots of senior German officers that have magnificent ones on there. On that. I take the point. I think my, my point was more about second class. That there really isn't any equivalent to the second class Iron Cross in terms of volume in the British Army. We tend to be rather mean about metals in my experience. Mm -hmm. One's honest about it. On there. Can you? Yeah. Sorry. Two seconds. Yeah. There's obviously a wonderful bit of initiative by the British military to develop the tank. Um, and take, the, take everybody by surprise, to say, cleverly. But what, what was happening on the German side? I, 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 I would require a small presentation to say, right, the German side, um, I think it can probably best be summed up by the fact that you know that a country has a problem when it decides to name an important piece of equipment by the name of a committee. <laughs> <laughs> the A7V is named after the Prussian Transport Committee. Right. Uh, and they only ever produce 20 of them. And what happens, in very simple terms, is that the Germans react to the first tanks by going, bloody hell, that was a good idea, why didn't we think of it? They then try and develop a tank, but by the time they've developed a tank, they go, mm, maybe that's not such a good idea, the Brits are not doing particularly well in early 1917. We don't, you know, the initial uses of tanks in 1917 aren't particularly <coughs> successful. The French have a particularly unsuccessful one a bevy of above where they take terrible casualties. And the Germans just lose interest for a bit. And then Colbray takes place, and Colbray they definitely win. Well, hell, what happened there? Right. And their reaction by then, it's too late to build more A7Bs. Right. And so the, the only thing they can do is to take Mark IVs and convert them to their use. They're sent to Charleroi, completely refurbished and sent back into action. Which explains why most German tanks in the First World War were actually British Mark IVs. Right. And the second tank to take action in history is Mark IVs against Mark IVs. Right. It's a really interesting little story, which I'm going to bore you. Well, the thing there, I think, is that the, the German, in 1940, the Germans had oh, well, a far better armor. Sorry. It reads, um, 
a Guderian's Achtung Panzer, right, which is a very objective, and I was a Guderian, probably, I would argue, the best armored commander that's ever existed because he's both a practitioner and a theoretician. And he writes a book in 1950 called Achtung Panzer, which consists entirely of a detailed analysis of how we won the war. Right? And it's quite a good analysis, it's quite objective. Right? On that, because some German stuff by that date, the Nazis don't like you admitting that they were beaten by, by us. It includes the French use of tanks as well. So they definitely learned the lesson on that. But that's a different presentation. Right? Funnily enough, I'm doing that to, to another group uh, on that one. Uh, how we failed on armour until 1942. But late 42, we're much, we've solved most of our problems on that. On that. One more. Can you tell me how tanks were transported behind the lines from England? From oh, no, sorry, and a really good question. There are no, ta there are no tank transporters, right, and that is a major problem. I mean, modern tanks, you largely need to move them on low loaders, and you could requisition civilian low loaders. Challenger 2, for example, is often moved by civilian low loaders on that, which are effectively flatbeds, which you turn with a significantly powerful turn unit on it. There are no, there's, there's no such thing, because remember, trucks are right at the start of the whole process, and there's no way they would be able to carry 30 ton tanks. So all moves of tanks in the First World War are done by train, right? And they load them on. There are, there are, they, the French had rail flats which could take a 30 ton vehicle by a piece of good fortune on that, and they then moved as close as they possibly can to the front line. So at Cambrai, they move within about five miles of the front line. On that Cambrai, part of the reason for the Cambrai offensive was that there was a small railway line that went along the edge of the front line. Mm. Right, and they then come off at various rail stations. By 1918, they got portable ramps on there. And by 1918, they can unload and load a tank company in, in less than an hour. Right, and I continue, because for reasons I won't bore you with, I ended up, and my regiment ended up having for a year to do entirely rail moves for tanks because nobody had remembered to order the tank transporters for us. That wasn't the regiment's fault on there. And so I know a lot about loading tanks on off rail flats and it's bloody hard work because you've got no... The, 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 a tank just fits so the driver has to know exactly what he's doing. How you did a Mark IV is beyond me right, because it's a bloody difficult steer, but they did. Um, so by 1918, they're doing really quite rapid moves. It's all done by rail, hence the import. I mean, you've got to remember, the rail network is the pivot to all logistics in the First World War. The road network is, 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 is of poor quality, so everything has to be done by rail. And it's quite dense, and of course, we run the north. The northern French railway system, the German, the French literally handed it over to us. They said, it's all yours, chaps. Off you go. And we did a pretty good job of it, I have to say, on that, which explains why uh, railways always had, in procurement terms, the order was normally aeroplanes, interestingly, railways, light railways, because light railways were critical for uh, logistics on there, uh, on there, and tanks were about third or fourth on the list, uh, because you had to have railways working, it was impossible not to. On that. Okay, there's one more, but you had your hand up. Um, when would radio first come into the use of the tank? Um, interestingly, uh, radio, as in Morse, uh, comes in. Um, uh, aircraft are using it, I think, late 1916, early 1917. There are wireless tanks by uh, Cobra. Right, uh, they're, 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 they're doing Morse, but there are wireless tanks by Cobra. <coughs> by the time you get to 1918, there are a significant number of wireless tanks. They, they can't do it on the move, they do it static, and the the sets are massively bulky on there, but you are looking towards, there are no radios uh, in the individual tanks. The only means of communication you've got on a Mark V is a speaking tube, which frankly didn't work, because right, the tank was so noisy. And if you were an infantryman, at the back of the tank, there was a little bell. <laughs> and you could go up to the back of the tank and do that sound. Now remember, that's not as stupid as it sounds, because a Challenger too has a box on the back of it where there is a tank yeah. telephone. And I can tell you, having been involved in the trials, that tank telephone, to make it work, cost because of fortune. Right? Because they thought they could get away with not making it work. And the Americans in Iraq copied the tank telephone. It's not stupid, actually. 
you know, if you're an infantry, if you see somewhere, you just make sure you use the telephone quickly, and because the tank might just reverse over you with the next move <laughs> on there. Uh, so to answer your question, very limited. There were large radios that were being used. There was extensive experiments. They knew they needed to get the technology going, uh, which explains the experiments, uh, the experimental tank brigade in the early, in the late 20s in the UK, which is largely about radio communications. And that, that is voice, and, and HF or VHF. The Germans use VHF, uh, of that. That's another story. Time for glass of wine next door. Um, utterly fascinating. Um, thank you very, very much indeed for this brilliant museum. Really great. A pleasure as always.